Hello, I'm Andrea Schleicher and I'm Director for Education and Skills at the OECD. It's a special privilege and pleasure for me to speak with state higher education leaders as you bear the principal responsibility for education in the United States. I wanted to share with you some insights from a recent study that we completed on the labor market relevance of higher education in four of your states. And we conducted that work over the past two years in close cooperation with the state agencies that are responsible for our education and with generous support from the Lumina Foundation. Let me first share some of our findings on graduate labor markets and then explore how state policies can help higher education systems become more resilient, more responsive to the needs of 21st century labor markets. I know you're going to wonder how an examination of labor markets and state policies in 2018 and 19 continues to matter today in the midst of a global pandemic, a global recession. But there's a lot we can learn from those data. And the one thing that hasn't changed during the pandemic is the need for well-designed policies that help align higher education and the labor market. In fact, it's going to be more, even more important in today's context than ever before. So why should we pay attention to the alignment of higher education and the labor market in the first place? Well, the question may be debatable from an institutional perspective, now, but when you look at this from a systems perspective, it becomes very quickly obvious how central knowledge and skills are to growth and prosperity. And if you ask students, you know, why they go to university, they're all going to tell you they hope to gain knowledge and skills that are going to get them well-paying jobs and fulfilling careers, fulfilling lives. In the United States, higher education institutions face especially high expectations that they will equip graduates with skills leading to good employment. And that's simply because of the very high level of investment from households and governments in higher education. Apart from the UK, you find no other country in the industrialized world that charges as high levels of tuition. So we wanted to answer two questions in our study. First, how well is the supply of graduates meeting labor market needs? And to answer that, we examined labor market data and convened employers and other stakeholders to learn where there were gaps. And second, we ask how are states using funding and other policies to link higher education supply and labor market demand? And that could we improve that? We identified four states for our focus. That was Ohio, Texas, Virginia, and Washington. So to be sure, their populations and economies are very different. But many of the challenges they face were actually quite similar and the policy measures they adopted provided a very good opportunity for policy learning. Today, higher education institutions and policymakers are struggling with the pandemic. In this map from October 8th uh, from the New York Times, we can see that college campuses often become COVID-19 clusters. You know, some people say colleges are cruise ships on land. Higher education institutions struggle to keep students and staff safe, to ensure that teaching continues and help students progress in their studies. And at the very same time, governments and legislators, state higher education leaders and university administrators are struggling with very serious financial hardships that come also out of this pandemic. And that makes it difficult to focus on the labor market outcomes of graduates, which are important, but which may not seem so urgent right at this moment. But let's look forward and focus on what happens to graduates as they enter the labor market. In the robust economic times of 2018 and 19, when we did this study, we saw that the US produced good outcomes on average, but actually comparatively wide disparities. I'm going to come back to that. And these disparities are deeply rooted. It begins in inequitable preparation for our education at school, which drives disparities in high school completion rates, and then continues with financial barriers to study and with study choices that many disadvantaged learners make, and then which leads them to low-paying jobs. COVID-19 is amplified, 
and accelerating many of those gaps. For example, many learners had to switch to online learning. That may work well for those with strong academic preparation, capacity to learn independently, and good conditions at home. But we know it doesn't work well for disadvantaged students. And today we already have evidence that enrollment is down sharply among Hispanic and black students, above all males. And if no action is taken, many students are going to fall behind in the months to come. And how come gaps may grow too between graduates in fields where good jobs may come back quickly, or think of technology, and those who feel the effects of a slow recovery on their career prospects. Now, let me take a step back and share with you what we learned in our study. We conducted it just before COVID hit, using data from 2018 and 19. At that time, the US economy had been growing since the end of the 2008 recession. Unemployment reached record lows, and most of the jobs created since the recession required some form of post secondary education. But you know, concerns about the value of higher education were already growing then, due to poor labor market outcomes for some graduates, and also because of rising student debt. State higher education systems in 2018 and 19 faced mounting pressures, including long-term declines in state appropriations per student, but also difficulties in understanding and responding to changing employer needs. And in that context, what did graduate outcomes look like? Uh, look at this slide. You can see a snapshot from a scorecard in our report that looks at key labor market data in a comparative perspective. Let me highlight two key messages here. First, graduate employment and earnings are good on average. No? The advantage of having some type of degree is greater in the US than on average in the OECD, although it differs between the states. No? That doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of higher education is better in the US. It is equally a sign of the US labor market being very, very good at extracting value from the skills that people have. Second, the type of degree matters a lot in the US. The gap in employment and earnings between bachelor graduates and those with an associate's degree is greater in the US than on average in the OECD. Now that suggests US employers continue to see the bachelor's degree as markedly more valuable than an associate's degree. And that matters especially in times of crisis where many people may look for shorter and cheaper alternatives to obtain valuable skills for the labor market. And again, you see important state differences here. Earnings premia also vary greatly by field of study and by state. You can see that on this slide, no? STEM and ICT graduates earn much greater premia than education and arts and humanities graduates in all of the states. No? But the size of the gap actually varies a lot across states. And the many factors that shape the differences in earnings premium. The high earnings premium of STEM and ICT graduates in all of the four states reflect the ongoing challenge of attracting enough young people to those fields. And a challenge that is rooted in uneven school level preparation in mathematics and science. In mathematics, our PISA tests of learning outcomes show US 15 year olds well below the average number. And the low earnings premium of arts and humanities graduates results from a combination of factors. The acquisition of skills that are not in high demand, but also skills high in demand, but that students do not signal well to employers. And these two cases are examples of misalignment. Now that's what we're talking about. In some cases, the low earnings premium of graduates resides neither from problems of supply or skill mismatching and signaling, but from modest wages set by employers. Teachers are a case in point. To sum up, one key message from the labor market data is that we should look beyond averages. Higher education is valuable on average, but it's important to know for whom it is, for whom it is not the case, and why. In the US, the highest earners are the ones doing the longest degrees in advanced technical fields like STEM and ICT. But shorter credentials can have strong labor market value too, and that's often in high demand fields. Take uh, cybersecurity, for instance. 
And these are often disproportionately male. Graduates reap the benefits of these short credentials if they work in the field in which they study. On the other hand, many graduates have disappointing outcomes. Students who enrolled in an associate's degree transfer program, which was a hope of completing a bachelor's degree, but who then don't transfer or complete a BA for one another reason. They may acquire few labor market relevant skills. And likewise, bachelor's degrees complete us in fields without a professional focus or without work relevant skills, which then can clearly demonstrate to employers they too may find it difficult to obtain well-paying jobs. And women, Hispanic and black students, continue to be underrepresented in fields of study that are leading to high wage jobs. Now, the types of degree and field of study are important, but it's critical to understand the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that employers are actually looking for. In our visits to the four states, employers told us that they wanted both specialized knowledge and skills, but also transferable skills. To look into that, we explored how big data can help us better understand what employers are actually looking for. We recently published the results in a paper, which we developed in parallel to our four states study. And in this paper, we analyzed over 9 million job postings for higher education graduates in the four states right, that range from 2010 to 2018. And together, you know, they contain thousands of skills. Many of these skills are highly specific to the job that was advertised. But actually others are widely transferable skills. So, we worked extensively on conceptualizing transferable skills and measuring the demand for them because they're applicable across many different jobs and many different industries. And they can help people adapt to new tasks and to new environments. And then we classified those skills in three categories, cognitive skills like quantitative reasoning, social and emotional skills like open-mindedness, and technical skills like computer coding skills. And with that approach, we move away from the traditional dichotomy between hard and soft skills. And we look instead at job specific skills versus transferable skills. It's very broad applicable and that can be used across many jobs. Here's just one example from our analysis. We looked at technology where the supply of graduates is clearly not sufficient to meet labor market demand, a key problem in every of the four states. So we wanted to know if employers would be willing to hire graduates from other fields of study other than ICT. And actually we found that among job postings in ICT occupations stating in a field of study, 60% of the postings welcomed applicants from other fields. Graduates from three fields seem particularly well suited to fill those positions. And not surprisingly, it was those with an engineering you know, background, business background, and mathematics or statistics. Job postings open to non-ICT graduates frequently listed industry certifications. That's really interesting too, not just degrees. And virtually all job postings required some advanced ICT skills, you know, like you know, computer coding computer programming. Many of those skills can be learned through online courses and validated by industry certifications and uh, alternative credentials. So there may be more avenues to expand supply than we usually imagine when we just look at the institutional sector. Alternative credentials is a topic of great interest in many countries. Now they are credentials that can be obtained outside of traditional higher education programs. But still, they still typically recognize the acquisition of skills that are valued in uh, the labor market. Now, it remains to be seen what role those alternative credentials will play in the labor market eventually. In a recently published paper, we conclude that employers are currently using them as complements to traditional academic degrees uh, rather than as substitutes for them. 
So they're not replacing degrees yet, but they're actually complementing them. There are also concerns about the quality and comparability of those alternative credentials. And new initiatives like Credential Engine will help in making them more transparent, more obvious to learners, but also to employers. In the future, they may play a bigger role as people look for cheaper and more flexible ways to acquire relevant skills. Let me now go back to what that all means in the hard times we are in. The imbalances may actually grow between the supply and demand for graduates, harming recovery. Falling institutional revenues may result in less money for student supports and higher dropout rates. And again, especially among the most vulnerable students. And the pandemic makes it particularly difficult for students to find the work-based learning opportunities that are actually so critical to acquire work-relevant skills and sometimes to get that first job. And you know, let's be you know serious. Labor market shortages may worsen in some areas. And those graduates without the ability to demonstrate the knowledge and skills that employers are actually looking for they may struggle with poor employment, poor earnings, and then they face high student debt loads. These concerns are really serious and they do require focused attention. But you know, that is what good state policies are all about. Once again, it all starts with coordination and alignment. Higher education in the US thrives thanks to a myriad of innovations that are taking place within the institutions. Too many people fall through the cracks as the many available options can become quickly overwhelming for people looking for their next step. And that, you know, is not just about young people. It also includes adults who've lost their job. So it's very important that states encourage greater coordination of higher education and also greater workforce training policy and work towards seamless pathways for all learners. Second, states can incentivize institutions to ensure that all students, no matter what program they are in, that all students have the opportunity to develop skills that are valued in the labor market. States can also work towards making the quality and value of alternative credentials much more transparent to learners, but also to employers. And finally, the importance of sustaining financial support to learners and institutions can never be understated. I know that's difficult, but it is absolutely essential to maintain the quality of higher education and avoid growing equity gaps. Let me close by pointing you to our recent work, our study of labor market relevance and outcomes in four states, and our three papers looking at employer needs using big data, alternative credentials, and labor market information, and student choice. Thank you once again for the opportunity to speak to you today, and good luck in your working sessions. Thank you. everyone and thanks for joining us. Uh, in 2008, when Jamie Marisotis became CEO of Lumina Foundation, he looked at the educational and economic data and realized if the U.S. didn't do something dramatic, we would lack the talent we need to not just thrive but to survive in the global economy. One of the sources of data Lumina used to make this case was an OECD report that showed that while the U.S. had once been a leader in higher education, the share among 25 to 34 year olds in the US had been rising slower than in other OECD countries in recent decades. And at the same time, the expanding knowledge economy was creating an even greater demand for workers with a post-secondary education, one that would actually require 60% of the US population to have a post-secondary credential by 2025. That's the goal. Since we set that national goal, 
44 U.S. states have set their own ambitious post-secondary education attainment goals, and a couple more are on the cusp of doing the same. While attainment is increasing across the U.S. and most states, we still have a ways to go, especially for Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. And it's also important to note that these goals are not just about counting credentials, but about ensuring that these credentials are high quality, that they lead to further learning and employment opportunities. We have to ensure that the credentials we're producing are aligned to the labor market. Over the last few years, the OECD embarked on a study of higher education outcomes and labor market relevance. Given the importance of this topic to the U.S. attainment goal, Lumina partnered with the OECD to conduct the study in the U.S. We recognized early on that it would be impossible, or almost impossible, to do just one study, given the vast array of labor markets and higher education systems in the U.S. So we decided to do deep dives into four states. We chose four very different states, geographically, politically, with different higher education systems. And we ended up with Ohio, Texas, Virginia, and Washington. The OECD then conducted a, uh, a, a study with the four states in 2018 to 2019. They did an overview of the US labor market and the higher education context and additionally, a range of poly policy examples from across OECD jurisdictions. The review was conducted before the global pandemic, and so it was under very different economic circumstances compared to those today. However, I would argue the findings still stand, and in fact, may be even more important today. And learning from the findings in this report can provide some solutions to help higher education help more citizens more quickly skill, reskill, and upskill. So I'm joined today to discuss the findings from these studies from representative leaders from across the four states. I have Peter Blake, and I'm gonna start from the east to the west. Peter Blake, director at the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia. Sherry Rice, the vice chancellor of higher education workforce alignment at the Ohio Department of Higher Education. Ray Martinez, Deputy Commissioner at Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And Mike Miotti, Executive Director at Washington Student Achievement Council. I wanna thank each of you for your time and talents over this last couple of years to do this report. And I'm really excited to dive into some questions about this report. Great, so Peter, I'm gonna to turn to you first, if you don't mind. Can you just talk a little bit about why did you decide to participate in this study and why did you think it would be beneficial for Virginia? Yeah, thanks, Courtney, for asking and, and welcome, uh, friends from SHEO. Good to see all of you. Wish we could be together. Um, I think one of the most, well, there are several factors, but I think one of the most um, important ones is OECD's expertise in labor market analysis. And so, as you know, an objective external perspective always can show you some weaknesses and maybe some of your strengths that you didn't know you had, and then perhaps offer some solutions that you might not have thought of. So OECD, as I said, just such experience in analyzing labor market data and looking at some other related data. You know, we get so um, uh, deeply involved in some of our higher ed data that sometimes we don't understand or appreciate the fuller picture. So I think that was one of the greatest values of our engagement with OECD, plus, of course, to work with and learn from Texas and Washington and Ohio. So those are some of the main reasons that we got involved. Great. Thank you. Ray, building on that a little bit, um, I'd be interested to know what you learned from the process. You participated in the process from a different seat that you're currently in now uh, as deputy commissioner. So. What did you learn? Um, any big ahas, um, any myth busters, or, or anything that just reinforced what you already knew? Yeah, thanks, Courtney. That's that's a great question, and and uh, uh, and, and yeah, I, I I do have sort of a different perspective. I, I uh, was interviewed uh, by the o OECD staff uh, wearing a different hat back when they were here in the state. Uh, you know, talking with different stakeholders here in Texas. At the time, I was president of the Independent Colleges and Universities of Texas, 
which is a nonprofit association that uh, serves the advocacy uh, interest of uh, 39 private not-for-profit institutions of higher education in the state. So, you know, in, the, in Texas, obviously, like my counterparts uh, from Virginia and Ohio uh, and Washington State, all have diversity uh, in, in their various sectors of higher education. That is definitely true here uh, in the state. And diversity, of course, we define in many different ways. But for, for the state of Texas, we have over 80 community college campuses spread out throughout the state. Uh, 37 public four-year institutions, 39 uh, private non-for-profit institutions, as I just explained. So, um, so all of that is any any time we have an opportunity uh, to gather data and to learn about uh, the the higher education infrastructure, um, I think is very valuable. So I agree with Peter that, that there's great value in uh, the in the in the the uh, the interviews and ultimately the report. Uh, that was produced by OECD. I think the aha moment, if I can think of one or two, um, would would be the the importance for for Texas because we have such diversity in our sector because we have geographic dis- diversity uh, and and uh, various institutional missions. The aha moment was the importance of the agency to really fulfill its coordinating board function. Uh, and again, when I participated in the interviews, I was not a part of the agency, but I've been working with the coordinating board throughout the last 10, 15 years of my career in higher education. So very familiar with the agency from a different perspective. Now I've been with the agency for the last eight months. There's no question that wearing the hat of an advocate, of an, of an, of an external stakeholder when I did the interviews, I was preaching the same thing that I that I that I think I take away now as one of the deputy commissioners, which is the importance of our agency of the coordinating board to build meaningful strategic partnerships. And I think one of the biggest takeaways from the report is the fact that the agency, while plugged in to various uh, aspects or all aspects of higher education, that's always been the case. We really need to be much more strategic uh, and much more deliberate in the relationships that we're building, not just with our primary stakeholders, which are the institutions of higher education across the state, but equally important with other stakeholders. For example, those two or three other state agencies that uh, that work on, that, that, that deal with workforce education, particularly the Texas Workforce Commission and the Texas Education Agency, which is our K through 12 state agency, we now have much more robust uh, uh, collaboration, in fact, formal collaboration, as is pointed out in the OECD in the OECD report, uh, through our tri-agency work group that has been formed by our governor's office, by state leadership, which now has some very deliberate charges and very specific charges that will foster and and I think encourage meaningful partnerships, not just for our agency with our higher education institutions but also with employers, with the Workforce Commission, with uh, nonprofit associations uh, that deal with in this workforce education space, et cetera. So the aha moment is one that externally I kind of saw and many of my peers saw it, and we were encouraging the agency to dig deeper and to build more meaningful strategic relationships. I think that certainly is true in reading the report. It's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the things that stands out and, and you know, our new commissioner of higher education, Dr. Harrison Keller, is very committed throughout his career. That's not an aha moment for him. He saw it as well as an external uh, observer. Now that he's been commissioner for the past year, we're actually emphasizing the importance of digging deeper and building these meaningful strategic partnerships. So uh, I hope that that helps to respond to the question, Courtney. There's a lot that, that comes away from this report, but perhaps that's the most meaningful. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. You know, I'm interested, Sherry, in your take. Um, Ohio is very different from Texas, but you sit in this higher education workforce alignment role. Um, so what did you see as, as an aha? You know, we we have a, a program um, called OMIC, Ohio Means Internships and Co-ops. And, and through this report, um, our reviewers really highlighted the fact that that was such a strong program. And it was something that we should probably look at to continue in the future. So looking to the OECD report was an opportunity to strengthen and expand partnerships with business and industry and in providing internships and co-ops and our apprenticeship opportunities for our students in a statewide effort. 
especially in work-based learning efforts across Ohio. Working with our other state agency partners, the Jobs and Family Services, the Office of Workforce Transformation, we know we have the will and the interest to make a positive impact. So building a platform from our Work Ready Pipeline for today and the future. And with the past successes of the OMIC program, we have a significant foundation which to build upon. So that was one of those reinforcements of, from the report that we got. In the past several months, our team has reached out to every institution of higher ed to learn how we can continue to be a resource during these challenging times. And part of that outreach has been uh, also including our business partners in those regions. We wanna be a resource for our stakeholders. We wanna include providing strategies and virtual work-based learning opportunities sharing the benefits and the value and add to their business community to continue to build their talent pipeline and how this will support their successful future. So that was an aha moment and a reinforcement at the same time. Great, thank you. So, um, Mike, based on your experience in the study and, and the final report, what recommendations do you have for other states? Um, you know, we were able to do this, this study with four states and have some pretty intensive methodology and, and other pieces, but if other states wanted to do something similar um, to better understand their labor market value and their post-secondary um, uh, system, what recommendations would you have for other states in the audience? Uh, ba basically two is, is number one, you know, I once lived on the other side of the table in some of these conversations. I was a state senator in another state many decades ago. Uh, and so I have a little bit of a, a, a sensitivity to the fact that sometimes we overwhelm public decision makers with too much information, too much data, too many spreadsheets. So I encourage people to focus on, uh, you know, they're gonna have to do all that analysis that we did, but, but to derive out of it the actionable knowledge that fits the attention span of governors, legislators, editorial boards, uh, community leaders, you know, et cetera. And secondly, uh, the report, uh, you know, brought even more attention in our agency and I hopefully in the state, the notion that you know, broad sweeping population level analyses are helpful at a certain, for certain types of conversations, but for the most point, part, if we want to really look at how life plays out on the ground, if we want to look at how life is affecting students of color, whatever, we've got to be able to disaggregate to the level that captures the experience of the, if you will, the people we're trying to help, the students, the future students, society, broadly speaking, and that is best understand, understood on the ground in specific contexts. And we can get the data to better understand that. And so I would encourage other states to be sure, don't just do a broad swipe population analysis, of the whole state, dig down, take a look at what's going on for these particularly equity sensitive populations and understand how it varies across different types of experiences, whether it's geographical or others that, that define lives in your state. Yeah, great, thank you. So I'm interested in, in kind of building off of that, Sherry, because you know this report, as I said earlier, was, was written pre-pandemic in a different, a different time. And so now we have the report. And so one of the questions you know, for each of you is, is now what? Um, you, know, you, you did this report with very different intentions um, and now it, it seems even more pressing that we need to, to get started and move on some of these issues. So Ray, I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind. I'd love to hear like, is this study still relevant in Texas? Um, and if so, what are your next steps with it? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's uh, very relevant. Uh, we have a legislative session that is uh, well, is slated to commence in January. And in Texas, we our legislature meets once every two years. So they're pretty high stakes, uh, 140 days of, of our state legislature and our state leadership. Uh, meeting uh, during that time period. So um, so it's relevant both timing wise, but also the substance of the report, um, I think is certainly uh, very relevant. Um, it, you know, what we, what we know, uh, m so much of our focus, particularly with having, Mike having come in in the past eight months, uh, has been the importance of uh, enhancing our workforce education offerings in the state of Texas. And I think for all of us, perhaps, uh, pre-pandemic workforce education and, the, and those uh, high value credentials probably looked different pre-pandemic than they look today. And, and that's one of the things that we're really focused on here in the state of Texas. Uh, we were allocated, I think every state was getting some of these gear funds, the, uh, the governor's uh, um, education emergency 
uh, relief, uh, some of the CARE Act funds, in other words. And for Texas, we received about $307 million in GEAR funds. And in July, our governor uh, announced that $175 million of those GEAR funds were going towards post-secondary education. So Commissioner Keller, uh, we got together as a staff with his vision to figure out, along with consultation with our state leadership, what, how, is this, how are these funds going to be used? And in the end, without going into too much detail, 150 million of that 175 that was allocated towards post-secondary education is going in the form of direct grant aid to students in various capacities. But one of the big buckets of that 150 million is 46.5 million that's going to go towards reskilling and upskilling workforce uh, stu students who are looking to, to get back into a workforce education program. And, and one of the challenges that we have is to identify what are the high value short-term credentials, particularly today uh, in, a, in a pandemic environment, which is different, we know, than it was uh, eight months ago, for example. And then the other challenge for Texas is the capacity. We know that we have 80 plus community college campuses, which are the, the that offer the bulk of our workforce education throughout the state. But looking at the data, we know that seven or eight of our largely urban community colleges offer 70 to 80 percent of our workforce education credentials. So what about those Texans that live outside of these uh, metropolitan urban areas? We need to increase capacity. And that's one of the things that we're talking to our community college leaders about, the association that represents community colleges. How do we use some of this gear funds? And I think it speaks to the to the recommendations that came out of the OER report, one of which was not strategic coordination, but it was also about how to, how to strategically use funding to meet some of the goals. And so we have to think about how can we, how can we use some of this funding to incentivize not just high value credential programs, but to incentivize capacity building uh, for our community colleges. So that's, that's more detail than perhaps you want, but it, it, it's an example of, of how this report has been relevant, both pre-pandemic and also relevant in informing our decision-making in a pandemic environment. So tell me, do you think the study is still relevant and what are your next steps in Washington? Well, I think it's even more relevant. Uh, and I think one of the things we have to understand about the effects of the pandemic in so many areas of life, and especially education, is it is most likely to accelerate things that were going on before. And so I think in this area, we what this report was responding to, uh, in part, uh, an increasing uh, focus by the public, uh, meaning potential students, uh, actual current students, uh, employers, et cetera, on the, the value proposition of specific programs in terms of how it sets people up for their life goals, especially jobs and earnings and you know, that kind of thing. We think the, the epidemic is just is gonna put, is putting that issue uh, on steroids. I think people are gonna be much, much more focused on this and the report, uh, and the report deals with that, but it also drives us in this new world uh, to realize that that value proposition for the public may best play out in programs that help people move from one sector of the labor market, likely retail, hospitality, food service, to another one that has uh, better pay, better career opportunities, but they need something to begin the transition over and it can't be a four-year degree that takes them seven years to get. We have to figure out how to make these cross-sector pathways work more efficiently for people to solve their needs. Peter, I'd love to turn to you now and, and hear your, your no, now what um, answer. So again, this study was done in pre-pandemic world. Um, is it still relevant in Virginia? And what are your next steps? Yeah, certainly it's still relevant. Um, I think the relevance of the report transcends the pandemic. Let me go back real quickly to something Ray said. Uh, I was struck by the meaningful strategic partnerships that he described. And just part of the process of working with OECD required us to go out and engage certain stakeholder groups in ways that you know, we thought we knew how to do. And, and while we do OK, there's always more we can do. And, and so I applaud OECD in setting up a structure that directed us to um, do some outreach in different ways and different groups. And, and I think that was beneficial to us and to all of our planning. So uh, I just wanted to go back and, and comment on, on Ray's um, way of characterizing those partnerships. But as far as uh, the pandemic and the relevance still today, uh, 
I think if nothing else, we need even stronger articulation between higher education and the labor market. And of course, the pandemic has, has upset the labor market in many ways, and we're going to emerge from it with a different economy than we had before. So I think uh, we need uh, the kind of assessment and thinking um, along these lines today more perhaps than we needed in February and March. Um, we in Virginia are in the midst of revisions to the Virginia plan for higher education, which is the statewide strategic plan that all of, all of you have. And at the same time, so, so this will inform that. We also have a couple of, of initiatives that were nascent and now are taking even greater form. And what came out of OECD will help us. Uh, one is a multi-level, multi-agency effort to better align the curricula and the programs that we have at our colleges and universities with labor market needs. And so trying to come up with a, a more objective and neutral body that can and report on the direction uh, where we need to go in certain areas and then working very closely on our academic side and the programs and curricula to make sure that they're better aligned. So this fit perfectly with that. We also have a maybe a, a one in the nation study, graduate outcome study that we're doing right now to look back at graduates over the last 10 years and particularly what they took away and how relevant their education was to their future life not just in employment, of course, but, but in other areas of their life. So that's a second area that this study has informed. And then a third is around, I think uh, Sherry mentioned an internship program in Ohio. And so we have uh, a new program that was created in 2018. So the timing of having this study and the results and the recommendations with um, how we roll out that internship program is, is particularly useful. So I think it's relevant today maybe even more so than it was in February and March. Excellent. Sherry, to you, um, a same question. You know, our, our, uh, we've been focused on so many other things since the pandemic. And so how, how is this report still relevant, if it is? And what are your next steps with it? Yeah, the report's more relevant than ever. Um, and, it, and it's the timeliness of it all. You know, we look at statewide policy and the initiatives that we had moving forward. Um, and one is being on resource management for our institutions and making sure that we as, an, as a state and we as an agency, coordinating agency, are providing the, the adequate and the necessary resources across to all of our entities as much as possible. One of the things that came out of um, COVID-19 experience, um, which moved some policy initiatives way up the chart, is our issues around broadband access and looking at it from the standpoint of how education is being delivered. And that's post-secondary and education as a whole. So looking at it from the standpoint of how can we as a state of Ohio improve or strengthen the statewide broadband access, and expand the resources for education and training as we move, or I should say, dive into a blended educational and training environment. Um, with statewide initiatives, with Innovate Ohio, Lieutenant Governor's Office, et cetera, ODHE and other entities, we have a goal to improve that access, promote reduce inequities in education and training, and strengthen the ability to offer an opportunity for growth and innovation through statewide entrepreneurship. We also have, you know, looking at partners across that we already have, like Lumina and um, National Governors Association, strengthening those partnerships as well as looking at those resources and the best practices that we can glean from that information. Um, one of the opportunities with the National Governor Association, we're embarking upon a post-secondary survey on broadband access. And Peter and I were having a conversation before today and talking about you may have broadband access, but do you have the devices to be able to perform this education and training uh, flow? So our goal is to, and I loved your your verbiage and one of the questions is myth busters. We're gonna use this survey to bust through the myths of where we believe we have those gaps in broadband access and have an opportunity to really uh, identify those gaps in service and for a stronger infrastructure across the state. This, this study helped put that in front of us, but then it really put it in front of us and moved those initiatives up our priority in our strategic planning process. And we're very much looking forward to the survey results and acting upon those findings, not just find out what those findings are, but acting on those findings. And then lastly, something that um, we talked about is upskilling and reskilling 
of our education training opportunities. Um, one of the efforts that the state of Ohio had put into place, and again, this policy really reinforced the need to support um, that retraining, that reskilling, and in, in particular, our incumbent workers and our adult learners. So state of Ohio uh, put in place a program called TechCred, where we help actually reimburse companies for putting individuals through a upskilling or a reskilling process um, and help the employers be able to continue to build their infrastructure and their growth opportunities, as well as building a, a needed talent pipeline for their future. So yes, the report's still very relevant and we're thankful to be a part of it. Excellent. So one one last question for, for each of you. And, you know, we have an incredible audience right now of state policy stakeholders, uh, and uh, they didn't all get to participate in, in this study. Um, and, you know, hopefully many of them will be able to read it. But what is something if you said, here's the one takeaway, this is what I want the audience to know about this report that they could use or, or be aware of. Sherry, I'll start with you. What, what do you think is that one important takeaway? Keep your eye out for best practices in other states. I think the opportunity to work with Virginia, Washington, just having this opportunity to be able to work with all four states and um, learning from each other, even though we may be unique in some of the offerings that we do and the policies that we put forth, but learning those opportunities from the other three states are just significant. So keeping an eye open to best practices across the other states and follow the strategies that are being implemented to support the future of education and the future of work. Um, resources, like I said, Lumina, OECD, SHEO work, National Governor Association. You have so many resources that you put in front of us all the time. Take the time to actually dive into those resources about best practices. Um, and, and, and have the opportunity to learn from those best practices and use them to achieve your economic growth opportunities and strong education policy moving forward. So yes, keep an eye on all those best practices. Um, Ray, I'd like to ask you also, if you could think about one thing um, from this process, from either the, the seat you sat in before or where you are now, and you know, implications or next steps that you, you think would be important, what, what do you want the audience to take away? What would be one thing from this report that's important. I think among other things, the report is really, uh, Courtney, uh, just a stark reminder that higher education, you know, irrespective of what state you live in, uh, higher education is complex, it's constantly moving target, and it requires a very timely and sort of multifaceted coordination and, and approach by all stakeholders. But that's particularly true of an agency like the one I work at, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Needless to say, not only across the U.S., but as I've already mentioned here in Texas, there is vast diversity in our higher education infrastructure. Um, and because of this great, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this large amount of variation, the, the need is even more imperative, quite frankly, for a strategic approach. And I think the, the, you know, the, the implications of, of, this, of this report are not just in the data that's been collected and, and amplified back to us as state policymakers, but it is in the fact that there's also been, uh, you know, a strategy that's put forward, a policy uh, framework, if you will, uh, to for better coordination, uh, for, for for strategic funding. You know, uh, I, my recollection from one of the the, the report's uh, uh, goals or policy recommendations was also to you know to increase not just educational offerings, but student supports and pathways, and that's another way that this report has informed us. We're actually doing very deliberate, very strategic conversations among stakeholders on how to increase transfer pathways, academic transfer pathways in particular between our two-year institutions and our public four-year institutions. So again, there's a lot that can be said that is sort of takeaway, very productive takeaways from a report like this. But, it, but, but overall, I think the most important thing is we have a, a really sound blueprint and really sound data that helps inform our state agency as we're gearing up for an important state leg state legislative session. Uh, they're, 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 to me, uh, that's exactly what we need is to be informed as we're getting ready for what will be a high stakes legislative session here in Texas. 
Yeah, I think the report really brought to life in, in Washington and for me, the challenge that has been sort of seeping up out of everything that's been going on for a number of years. And that is that we really have got to embrace the notion that education is a long-term pathway for the people who travel down, for the students and others who travel down that pathway. Uh, that's the way they see it, right? And the different pieces of that pathway, the different programs, the different schools, whatever it is, and I'm talking about everything from, you know, or even early childhood education through K-12, through, through whatever you do in post-secondary and whenever you take it, that is a long-term pathway that you need to successfully navigate to have success. We, on the other hand, in the education world, tend to be focused on our program, our institution, our piece of the pathway, right? And that type of thinking in which we are an island and we build certain models of how you get to be on our island and how you get to be successfully off of our island or unsuccessfully off our island, all of those behaviors that focus on our world, our island, and not on the students' pathways sets us up for many of the failures that we're trying to turn around and especially failures in terms of serving first gen and students of color and underserved populations. Thanks. Peter, what would you say? Courtney, I'll go back to where I started, kind of the rich, the richness of the data analysis that OECD brings to this. I mean, it was a fascinating process to watch them come to our state, meet with people, dig through our data, and then how they synthesized it and put it together and combined it with other data, that, again, that we don't routinely review. So that I would call attention to chapter two in particular, and this is where uh, they compare the alignment of higher education and the labor market. And they use some, as I said, some of the traditional data that we use in looking at higher education, but combine it with things like GDP per capita, employment rate, annual median earnings, population, uh, certain kinds of trends and other demographic features. And just so I, I would uh, encourage other states to look at some other data points and combine it with what we already have and, and then use that to inform many of your decision processes as we are now with our statewide strategic plan and some of the initiatives that we have other, uh, underway that I mentioned. And then finally, I'll just go back again to the strategic partnerships that Ray mentioned early on. Um, use uh, these opportunities to engage your business community and your academic leaders on a topic uh, that maybe you've had the conversations before, but now you might want to have them differently given the, the, the COVID era in which we live. Um, and, and just, again, kind of mixing the richness of the data with the, with the urgency of, of the need and, and um, putting it all together in some ways that fit within your strategic planning within your state. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. And, um, you know, I, I think you're right. In some ways, the report is, is almost a blueprint that other states could could use um, and, and do some of the same things, follow the same methodology that OECD used. So I, I like, um, I think that's an important component. So I just wanna end by, by thanking each of you um, for your time and talents throughout this process. This was not an easy ask. Um, this required uh, opening up your calendars, your networks. Um, I appreciate your staffs and your colleagues for an incredible amount of time over this almost two year process that, that got us to this point. Um, so again, thank you. And, and I do hope that others will go and look at this report. Um, and I think there are a lot of incredible takeaways for, for every state out there. So again, thank you so much to, to each of you. I appreciate you.